I am Becca Young, I'm the temporary supply pastor, and I'm thrilled that you are to here with us today on this Palm Sunday. I would like to invite you first, before we start this service, quick, while I'm doing these announcements, run and get your Bible. Uh, maybe some of you already have it, but get your Bible, because we're gonna first be reading from Psalm 118, and then we will move to Matthew 21. So just so that you're getting ready to read the Bible, Secondly, I also want to say that it is Palm Sunday, so of course we all have our palms, so if you don't have a nice green palm from our beautiful environment, our world, you can use your own palms today to raise up in glory to the Lord and to proclaim Hosanna in the highest. However, we do have this beautiful arrangement of palms here in the sanctuary for us. And we have here prayers from the palms that have been done for the love of God, for love of our neighbor, all of the things that we want to pray for on this holy day. Supported by the palms, just as the people of Israel held up the palms before Jesus. So we're thankful to Sandra Mentor for this arrangement. And we also have the prayer here for the conditions, for all conditions of humankind. So we're very grateful to have that. Also, in terms of announcements, I'd like to remind you that this coming Maundy Thursday, the McAllister Church will be holding a Maundy Thursday service. Now, it's our tradition among our churches that we always share these services during Holy Week, that McAllister worship, worships, has the service on Thursday and we worship with them. And then on Friday, we do the Tenebrae service and they worship with us. So this Thursday and Friday, I'm hoping that you will join them. They will be broadcasting live on their Facebook page, their service on Thursday, so let's all join with them as First Pres. And then on Friday, we invite them, McAllister folks, to be on our YouTube channel or church web page to join our broadcast for the service of Tenabre at 7.30 on Friday night. We welcome you to join us for both of those services on Thursday and Friday. I'd also like to remind you that I am doing a morning prayer every morning at 8 o'clock, but I decided, I got all excited because I realized next Sunday, um, sunrise is at 649. So I'm going to do the morning prayer if technology cooperates with me. Maybe I'll try to start at like 647. And we will have our sunrise service through morning prayer, our morning prayer service through my um, uh, virtual connection down on my farm. So I hope I'll see you next Sunday for a sunrise service. And then at 945, all of you First Pres folks, you're invited for coffee here. We're going to do a Zoom virtual coffee and get in touch with Joe Wilson about if you'd like to be part of that coffee. And I, for those of you who, who aren't church members but still want to be involved, I'm going to figure out a way to rig up another computer to have it on YouTube as well so you can be part of our coffee hour next, our fellowship, virtual fellowship next Sunday at 945. See you then. And then, of course, at 11, we will have an Easter service. So, um, all right. So how about that? Here we are in the house of God. Wherever that house of God is for you, indeed your house is also a house of God and a worthy place in which to worship God today on this beautiful Palm Sunday. So let us together worship God using the words of Psalm 118. So let's go to our Bibles. As I get mine, you have a chance also to get yours. So we start with Psalm 118, we will do verses 1 and 2, and then 19 through 24. So let us all together read the words of the psalmist. A song of victory. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good and God's steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. And now verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness. 
that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. Dear God, we ask that you be with us in this worship service, here in your house in Covington, but also in the homes of all who are watching, in the hearts and minds of every person today who is lifting up their palms to you, O oh Lord. Be with them and let us together, as this virtual community, worship you. We will now sing the hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. We're going to be singing what's actually the second and third voice, verses, but we will start with the refrain, which should be familiar. Sandra will give us an introduction, and then I am going to, if technology cooperates with me, I will have the words to the hymn on the screen. So now, let us, so we'll sing two verses, but it will be refrain, verse, refrain, verse, refrain. So now let us worship God using the beautiful words of all glory, laud, and honor. And now, knowing that we are indeed the children of God, it is a time for us together to confess our sins before God and neighbor. We know that God is willing to hear us, and so I ask you now with boldness to approach the Lord and confess your sins. We will start first with a silent prayer of confession, and then I will ask you to join me with the words on the screen for a confession that we make together. Let us confess our sins.
Dear God, forgive us when we become so wrapped up in our own concerns and fears that we forget to lift up our palms and turn to you as you come towards us in love and humbleness, asking to enter our hearts. Forgive us for thinking that the things of the world have mo more power over us than your love for us does. Forgive us when anxiety causes us to trust in worldly saviors and solutions instead of in your Son, our true Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, dear friends, I would like to read to you from the book of Matthew, chapter 21. But first, let us ask for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as we hear the, wor the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Open now our hearts, dear Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us in the end any voice but your own, that hearing we, amay, we may obey your will. In Christ's name, by the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. So we're reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them. And he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and their, they put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, I know all of us are sad today because the sanctuary is only Sandra and I together. And we feel it, and we know you feel it too. We're missing that excitement of Palm Sunday, of seeing the children carry the palms, of we ourselves grasping the palms in our hands and imagining for ourselves what it would have been like to be there with Jesus that day. So I'm going to try to go with the when life gives you lemons, and we've certainly been given lemons here, much worse than lemons, right? We're going to make lemonade. So let's try, in the absence of the palms in our own hands, we have our own palms, of course, but let's go past that sort of ritual aspect of it, as important as that is. On, and next year, I look forward to us doing it once again together here in this sanctuary. But in the meantime, let's take this opportunity to look deeper into the real meaning of what it meant for Jesus to come through the gates of Jerusalem on a donkey. We don't have a lot of time to sit around and think about that. So let's think about it today. And the first thing I was thinking, you know, 
when I was reading this, I, I read it first on Monday, and I got to the part, I, it starts with saying something about this place, Beth Page, and I probably just pronounced it wrong. I was supposed to say Beth Paga or something, so I have no idea what Beth Page is, and I'll be honest with you, I figured it was a place. I'll save you the searching. It's not on Google Maps. Had to go to Wikipedia. It turns out it was a small neighborhood just outside the gates of Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. It's gone now, sadly, built over. But Mount of Olives is still there, and of course we all know about the Mount of Olives. So I'm thinking, my next thought when I read, well, this Beth Page place that Jesus paused in before he came into Jerusalem, I thought, well, why did he pause? What, what, what did he pause for? Why, why didn't he want to just go straight into Jerusalem? Because you, you've heard this from me before in my sermons, nothing in Matthew is wasted. The author of Matthew always has a very good reason for why he writes the things that he does. This detail of Jesus pausing for some reason or another is very important. So first I just thought on my own, well, psychologically, you know, Jesus loved Jerusalem as the holy city. So I imagine that he was stopping just to look out over it. There's another beautiful passage where he looks out over the city of Jerusalem and says, oh my Jerusalem, I love you like a mother hen. I wish I could protect you with my wings, my baby chicks. I, I, that's such a beautiful, caring image of our Savior caring for us. So that's the first thing. I thought, well, you know, he's just looking out over his city. He's also realizing that the next steps he is taking are the steps on the road to the cross, that what he's about to do is going to cause him to be crucified. And I mean what he's going to do today. And I want to explain to you why. But also, we as modern readers don't understand another thing that Matthew's readers would have understood. That in culture at that point, when a king, and there were kingdoms all around the Mediterranean, in southern Europe, in northern Africa, here in the eastern Mediterranean, all of the kingdoms, when their kings went out on trips and visited towns and entered into cities, the king would always stop outside the gates for a few moments to pause. It would give, first, probably him a rest from his long um, journey to the city, maybe he fixed his makeup or his hair or something, took his helmet off and fixed his, he his helmet head. And then he gave the people time to line up in preparation, to lay out their garments, to get their palm branches, and even more importantly, to prepare their petitions to bring to him, their requests, their needs. This might have been the only time in their entire lifetimes that some of these people would get to see their king, their savior, the one who had the power to save them. And so this was their one moment. This was way before email or Twitter. You can't even call an assistant and leave a voice message for that leader. You, this was your only chance first to see him face to face and to tell him what you needed from him. So think how beautiful a moment this was for Jesus to stand there to allow those people to get ready first to praise him with their palms, but secondly, to open their palms to him, their human palms, and request from him. So I also think Jesus very clearly was showing that he was the king the new ruler who was coming to rule in love and give the people a chance to ask for what they needed. Amen? Now, more than that, I also was thinking, I once was given some acting instructions which said that when an actor walks out onto the stage, it's a really good idea at that very first moment when they step on the stage to pause for just a second, almost to catch your breath, and then go on with your words and your actions on the stage. It, it makes a more dramatic impact on your audience and even helps you transition onto the stage. So, first of all, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Jesus was an actor. Everything in this, in this performance, everything he's doing is truly from his heart and from the heart of God. But he is staging this. He is making this an incredibly dramatic performance because he's making a huge statement, not just to Jerusalem, but to the Roman rulers and to the world about who he is and why he's coming into the city. 
Now, I love this because what he's really saying, again, I was saying he's acting like a king. He's not just acting like one. He is one. He sent his disciples ahead. He knows exactly what he's doing, how he's staging this. He's telling them to bring him a donkey, which will have a cult. He tells them beforehand exactly what they're going to see when they get there and how to ask for the donkey and the words to say he is definitely the director in this performance. And, he's, and the, they bring him the donkey, and he gets on it, and he rides in. Now, the moment he is riding in, again, what we don't know as modern readers, we don't realize what everyone at that time would realize, that this was the Sunday before Passover, and what was happening at the exact same time that Jesus was coming in from the Mount of Olives on the east through an eastern gate of Jerusalem, Pilate and his forces on horseback, and in chariots were coming through the west gate. So let me explain to you why this was happening. Goes back to Herod. Remember Herod the Great, the king who wanted to kill Jesus. He's dead by now, but his influence is going on. He is built, back when he was heavily taxing the Jews, he built this huge, gorgeous uh, resort on the Mediterranean Sea. He built himself a huge palace, and he handed it over to the Romans, and they loved it so much, who wouldn't want uh, residents on the Mediterranean, gorgeous Mediterranean. They built their palaces there as well, and so did Pilate. And now the Romans have their center, their headquarters for ruling this whole region around Palestine. They rule it through from Caesarea Philippi. That's the name of the town, Caesarea Philippi. So Pilate, he doesn't live there. Nobody wants to live in Jerusalem. It's some kind of backwater. So Pilate has come with his, I can just see it, Ben Hur on steroids. Four horses and a huge chariot with a driver. Pilate is coming through that west gate with all of his horses and men, soldiers around him to show those people that he is in charge in Passover. Because we need to remember what is Passover. It was a celebration of what? Of the liberation of the Hebrew slaves from the oppression of the Pharaoh. It is a celebration <laughs> of a rebellion and an overthrow of an oppressive power. You think Rome didn't know that? They knew that very well. And they were going to make sure that the Israelites, oh, you can have your religious celebration, but don't you be thinking this is some kind of political statement. You keep this among yourselves, and we're going to show we're in control. All right, so do you now see what I mean when I say Jesus was making this incredible performance? He was showing the world the contrast between him as the true ruler and Pilate whose rule is through power and military force. So if you ever want to say, oh no, Christianity is just spiritual, read the Palm Sunday lesson. It is so powerfully political. Jesus is making such a strong statement toward Pilate right now. He's basically saying, I'm the real ruler and I come on a donkey. So one scholar I read made a kind of a fun thing. He said, you know, in this performance, Jesus is both king and jester. He's the king, the true ruler for the true people, but toward Pilate and his armies, he's the jester. He's going, nah, 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 nah. I don't care about your chariots and your horses. I got God on my side, and I'm bringing you guys down. And not through military power, but through love. And the reason I know this is because also, I told you how Matthew's author never wastes words. The very next, um, when, the very, very next verse after Matthew says that Jesus is coming in on a donkey, he then says this is to fulfill the prophets, what the prophets said. And sure enough, in Zechariah 9.9, it says the Savior will come in on a donkey to save the world, to save uh, Israel and, the, and therefore the world. So the very next verse says, it says that that donkey rider will overthrow the people on the horses and bring an end to military power and violence in this world through a path of peace and love. The Jewish hearers of this would have had that passage memorized because that's what they were hoping for. And they would have known that Jesus was making a huge statement by riding on a donkey, a borrowed donkey no less, and coming in as a king, a new kind of ruler. So it's, that, it's a huge statement. And I also love that Jesus also already knows in five days he's going to face Pilate. And when he's in front of Pilate, Pilate is going to say to him, are you king of the Jews? And Jesus, in his cryptic fashion, says, if you say so. But the fact is, 
Jesus has already answered him five days earlier. So when, it's, when Pilate asked this question, Jesus really could, if he wanted to be, he could say, don't you remember last Sunday, that whole thing where I came in through the gates? I'm, I am the king. So I love that Jesus an already answered the question. So by the time Pilate asks it to him five days later, that's old hat for Jesus. Of course I am. I love that. All right. So now the next thing is that this whole idea of Jesus on a donkey, I, it's so fun. Now, uh, first of all, Israelites loved their donkeys. All Palestine people loved their donkeys. And there's so many stories in the Hebrew scriptures about the relationship between um, Israelites and their donkeys. Because the donkey is the constant companion. Every single major figure in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, rides a donkey. Men, women, children. There's even a donkey who talks. Also, donkeys got to their own rules in the, in the Torah, believe this or not. Um, one thing is you're supposed to care for your donkey. Jesus even has an argument with scribes and Pharisees. They say to him something about what you can do on, on Sunday, on the Sabbath, I mean. And Jesus says to him, hey, even any one of you, if your donkey fell into a well, you'd save it on its Sabbath, wouldn't you? So Jesus is using the donkey, the love, the scribes and Pharisees love for their donkeys too, to say that the Sabbath is made for humans and donkeys, not for the law. All right. And then, and this is really cool, there's actually a law somewhere in Leviticus probably, I, sorry, I didn't look it up, but it says that the, the donkeys get to have the Sabbath rest. From sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday, donkeys are not to work. Isn't that great? They get a break every Saturday. All right, and then you also knew about another rule that you hadn't even thought about. Let's, you can say it with me. 10 Commandments, what's number 10? You shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's spouse, your neighbor's servant, or your neighbor's donkey. The donkeys even made it into the Ten Commandments. And so this is how much the Israelites loved their donkeys. So the fact that Jesus was on one was really powerful. I was also thinking, you know, a donkey, when someone's riding a donkey, they're right at your eye level. So it's kind of nice. You know, you can really talk to them. I was thinking of the, the closest sort of analogy would be, since I live in rural Virginia, it's like a pickup truck. You know, your pickup truck, I would assume, those of you who own pickup trucks, it's your best friend. You know, I've kind of turned my little Kia Soul, I've turned it into my pickup truck. I go pick up bales of hay and say, ah, I put it, we'll put down the tailgate and throw in the bale of hay. Pickup truck is the Israelite equivalent of the donkey. Because you know, how many of you tell me you haven't stood by a pickup truck and had a conversation with the guy in the driver's seat, or the gal in the driver's seat? It's so, you can have a tailgating party in a pickup truck, right? A donkey, this is the pickup truck of the Israelites, so loved, so cared for. And so really, I want you to hear that when Jesus came through that gate on Palm Sunday, he was driving his pickup truck right into our hearts and lives to bring us salvation. Another really fun thing from the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures that connects this is when Joseph, remember how Joseph was in Pharaoh's house? This again is the thing why Jesus is making a statement about throwing over the oppressors. When Jesus was, uh, jo Joseph was in Pharaoh in Egypt with Pharaoh and there was the time of famine and then of plenty. Um, I mean, plenty then famine. During the time of famine, Joseph sent food supplies and relief supplies on donkeys to Israel. So in other words, donkeys came into Israel in their time of need, bringing salvation. And so now, if I can say this without crying, Jesus coming through that gate on that donkey is bringing salvation into Jerusalem, but not just into Jerusalem into our hearts and lives. Jesus is driving that pickup truck through the gates of First Presbyterian Church right into Covington, Virginia. <laughs> That's the love <laughs> of our God for us. That he comes to us in humbleness and meekness to say that he loves us and he's here bringing salvation for you and me. So now if I can use the pickup truck analogy, I was also thinking, what's another way that we can really think about how we as the church should be behaving right now? You know, it's so hard in this 
time. But shouldn't the church, this is maybe when we can't be in this building, we need to remember that the church is not a building, it's the people. And that we as a people, symbolically for the people of Covington, for the people of Allegheny County, for the people of Virginia and for the world, we need to be the gate. We need to be that gate for Jesus to come through to us bringing healing and love and peace and salvation. Can I get an amen? Thanks be to God. Amen. Next, I would like us to say together the Apostles' Creed. And I'm hoping that you know it well enough. For those of you who don't, you can listen. Listen as we, as the First Presbyterian Church in Covington, say together what we believe. Let us confess the faith of our baptism. Brothers and sisters, will you join me? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, dear friends, the other great privilege of this Jesus who comes to us as one of us, Emmanuel, God with us, is that any time he has invited us to pray in his name. So now this is the time that we bring our joys and concerns to the Lord. So we will pray together. And at the end, I will pray for you first. I'll give you some silent time to say your own prayers. And then together we will say the Lord's Prayer using debts and debtors. First of all, we have some joys that I would like to report. It's always great to have good news, isn't it? So our first good news is we are very proud, as First Presbyterian Church, that we had supported grants that we submitted to our presbytery. For those of you who don't know presbytery, it's our governing board for this region, um, our administration for this region. They have given us grants, and they approved the grants, both going to two local Covington, Allegheny County area services, first safe homes, to help them buy, purchase a vehicle in order to transport people safely who are in dangerous situations. And then Bridging the Gap, a wonderful educational program for people to help lift them up out of poverty by giving them skills to deal with this crazy world. So we're very excited and we can give thanks to God for this gift. We also indeed are grateful to hear that all of our missionaries, Nadia, Tim and Marta, Kaylee and um, Nathan, uh, Elmer and David, they are all safe in their places wherever they are serving. They, have, they are staying in place and we're very glad for the witness that that gives and we're glad to hear they are safe. And we give thanks to them for their ministries, for them being the gates to let Jesus enter the communities in all the places where they serve. We are thankful for them. We do know, however, that we have lots of to pray for so we have this beautiful palm arrangement here with our prayers on it. And so here we have prayers for all who are affected by the coronavirus, for those who are serving during this time of the coronavirus, for those who are indeed shut in as we all are, for all the many concerns. And so I want to read to you the prayer that has been placed here. Um, and to remember that these palms, like our palms, are lifting up our call to God to come and save us, to be our salvation who comes into this world and heals us and rescues us. So let us read this prayer. For all conditions of human humanity, O God, the creator and preserver of all humankind, 
we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of people, that thou wouldst be pleased to make your ways known unto them and your saving health unto all nations. Your saving health, dear God, unto all nations. More especially, we pray for the church, that it may be guided and governed by your good spirit, so that all who profess and call themselves Christians will be led in the way of truth and hold faith in the unity of the spirit, in the bond of peace and the righteousness of life. We also commend to your loving and steadfast and never-ending unbreakable care all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed in mind or body, that it may please thee you to comfort and relieve them according to their needs, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now we pray together the, so the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So now, dear friends, let us indeed raise our voices in Hosanna. The word Hosanna means save us. So as we raise up our palms, we say to God, save us. We need it now more than ever. So will you join me as we sing together two verses from Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Let us sing. <laughs> Dear friends, I ask you to remember that we do have palms, so let us open out those palms to a world in need. Be the gates that allow Jesus to come into this world, the true ruler who reigns in peace and love. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love now and forevermore. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>